Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to yet another Work Package E closeout meeting, the last Work Package E closeout meeting actually. So we had a total of 40 projects and complexity cost is, is actually the last of the projects in Work Package E. The project was led by the University of Westminster uh, with uh, Andrew Cook and, and Graham and Louis. Inaxis was also part of the project consortium, so Samuel is here for, for Inaxis. And we initially had DLR, but they decided to pull out of the consortium, so it is Westminster and Inaxis who did the bulk of the work. And before I try to explain what complexity cost is all about, I spent about two and a half years trying to, to understand it, I'll hand right over to, uh, to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dirk, and uh, thank you for the opportunity of presenting our uh, results to you today, and thank you for the, the turnout. It's, uh, we appreciate you spending your time to come and listen to what we have to say. The team is listed here in alphabetical order, and I have the honour as the project leader just to make a few slides of introduction at the start, and then I hand over the line light to my colleagues, Louis Delgado and Samuel Cristobal, who did the bulk of the nice modelling work and the implementation of the model, so they get the real limelight today. I'm going to just start off, as I said, with just a few slides from me in terms of introduction, starting off a little bit with the motivation and objectives. I know it's bad practice to read out what's written on the screen, but I'm going to make one exception and allow myself just to read the first paragraph. The objective here was to gain deeper insights into ATM performance trade-offs for different stakeholders' investment mechanisms within the context of uncertainty, and to what extent do these mechanisms mitigate the impacts of disturbance. Just to unpack that a bit, and we're going to unpack it a lot during the course of the next hour, but by performance trade-offs we mean things like cost of delay generated in the network, what do we mean by investment mechanisms? By mechanisms, we mean stuff we do as ATM stakeholders to try and manage disturbance and uncertainty in the network, such as implementing ACDM. And we use the word mechanism to stress we're covering a wide range of things we might do to help manage this uncertainty and disruption. We call them investment mechanisms to remind ourselves from the start that these mechanisms come at a cost. So we're investing money when we put the mechanisms in place, and that's not all what complexity cost is about, is trying to understand the cost-benefit relationship between the money we invest in the mechanisms and the value we get back in terms of mitigation and reduction of disruption. We hope one of the key things we might have done to differentiate our work from some other work before is to include the important context of uncertainty in the way we model these interactions. It's very important in our view to move the state of the art forward into in including and embracing uncertainty rather than having deterministic models which don't really work as well in terms of understanding how things work in reality. And then we want to understand how these mechanisms, the thing we do, mitigate impacts of disturbance, for example by reducing delay. And we'll come on to define what we mean by disturbance and expand on that momentarily. Another thing was that a high-level metric for measuring cost resilience in ATM performance assessment was pretty much missing. An objective of the project was to try to come up with a high-level metric for cost resilience, which we did and tested, and you'll see the definition of that metric in a moment and the results based on that from my colleague uh, Lewis. One particular area of focus from me was looking at the exploitation and application. So we had a lot of coordination with industry during the course of the project, and we've been quite heavily focused on what we can do next in terms of raising the applicability and the TRL with uh, future follow-up work. And we have some slides on that at the end of the presentation from Lewis. I think it's always best to explain things in a picture. So we have the ATM network, and as part of the outputs from the network, we're all familiar, we have indicators and metrics to understand what's going on. Then we have the agents involved in how the network works, the airlines, passengers, ANSPs and airports, etc. And their understanding of how the network is performing is based on their looking at the indicators and the metrics. And then, of course, stuff happens. Nothing goes to plan. We have disturbance and uncertainty. And so we have to understand and include the impact of disturbance and uncertainty in our simulation models. Because we know disturbance and uncertainty is bound to happen ahead of time, we come up by uh, thinking and engineering different types of mechanism that we can apply to the network from the stakeholders. 
to try and mitigate this uncertainty and disturbance. Like I say, a mechanism could be something like ACDM. We'll come and explain the four mechanisms we investigated and why subsequently. So this has impacts on the indicators and metrics, hopefully improving performance by having the mechanisms in place. And the stakeholders are then making observance of how well the implementation has improved performance by measuring these metrics. For example, if you can't see, it's supposed to be a bunch of used notes. So we might be measuring that by looking at the cost of delay, for example. But, as I said, we have to remember that the mechanisms themselves in the first place cost us money to implement strategically and to run tactically. So the whole thing of complexity costs is understanding this balance, the trade-off, between the strategic investment costs, the tactical running costs of the mechanism, and the benefit you get back in terms of, in this case, the way we modelled it, uh, reduction of, for example, cost of delay and other metrics. We define disturbance as something which could cause disruption. You might have a disturbance which doesn't cause disruption, for example, because it's absorbed by an airline buffer. A disruption is where you actually have some upsetting of normal operations. They're significantly degraded. And we have a number of definitions we've explored during the course of the project of resilience. For example, absorptive, which might be putting buffer into a schedule. Adaptive, where you reroute aircraft or re-accommodate passengers. Or restorative, where you put something back into the network, such as additional controller hours. We've investigated all of those as part of the mechanisms. So resilience in pictures, we can have some a landscape here of stability on one axis and time on the other. And we start off with the, the green blob on the left-hand side with a network in a, an equilibrium state at T0. And then it falls down the slide, down the red line here to the bottom, due to some disruptive event. And you end up with this distorted state of the system at the bottom in the orangey type coloured pentagon where it's squished out of shape. Then your mechanism comes into play, your resilience action, and pushes the state of the system back up the slide towards a higher stability state. And on the right-hand side, you reach a new equilibrium point, and that might be at a higher or lower cost or a different type of stability than the one you started, or it might be the same, but it's a new equilibrium. There's a number of terminologies for resilience through the literature going way back to 1948 through to the one from Holnagel in 2006, which has been the one mostly adopted in ATM and air transport with a focus on safety, which is the resilience engineering definition. We, of course, covered those in the deliverables, but what we want to stress here is we are trying to move not only to a better qualitative definition of resilience, but to a quantitative formulation of what we meant by resilience. So we came up with a metric, which is RC, which you'll see quite a lot towards the end of the presentation, which is trying to quantify the cost resilience. So in the term, I mean, we include the disruption costs. Uh, so what the cost is of the disruption without the mechanisms in place, our baseline status. We take account the cost of the disruption with the mechanisms in place so we can see the benefit. And we also have to take into account in the formulation the investment running cost. For ACDM, the cost of having staff there, for dynamic cost indexing, the cost of burning extra fuel to recover a delay, etc. So we need to take into account the investment running cost as well. Subject to these constraints, various, all of these terms basically have to be greater than zero. You end up resilience metrics which are less than or equal to one. One means you have a perfect resilience, and zero means it's not very good at all. And you'll see the numbers we produced at the end of the presentation. We also have complementary metrics, so not only cost resilience, we have flight-centric metrics. We have, I think, something like 100 metrics which are run in the simulation. We focus on a few of them during the course of today. So we have the standard ones, which we're all familiar with, flight-centric, like the average delay of an aircraft. We have passenger-centric metrics, like the average delay of a delayed passenger, because as we've demonstrated before and has been demonstrated in the literature, the average delay of a passenger is not the same as the average delay of a flight. So we need to look at them both because they're not the same thing. And cost-centric metrics, such as the cost of delay. And basically so far, in terms of the impacts on the network, we're measuring disturbance at the moment on airlines in terms of cost of delay, Passengers in terms of delays their journeys. We also have some value of time metrics. And as you'll see later, the environment as well. We can also measure CO2, um, airborne and ground CO2 as part of the mechanisms under the disturbance. Another feature which we're pleased to have implemented as part of the model is we have differentiated degree of adoption of the mechanisms. So we plan the mechanisms and we don't say, OK, everyone does ACDM and we look at the future when ACDM is everywhere or everyone's doing dynamic cost indexing or everyone fix the problem of not having enough ACO hours. 
we differentiated the uptake for the stakeholders on the supply side, if you like, from ANSPs, airlines and airports, essentially based on their size, how much money they've got to throw at investing into the mechanisms. And then for ANSPs based on traffic density, for airlines based on the business model, as you'll see later, we assume those with a connection model were more likely to invest in some of the mechanisms. And airports based on the planning already published from Eurocontrol for a CDM uptake. We have three levels in the model of uptake. So we start off with the baseline, which is our attempt at modeling the current operational level of uptake of the four mechanisms which we investigated. And then we look at uptake by what we've called the early adopters, where we think it makes most sense for who's going to invest next in the four mechanisms, and then the followers, what would come on in some years after that in the next phase. And we can compare the results of the simulations based on these uptake levels. And each uptake level includes the two previous or two or three previous ones. We had a lot of collaboration. Yeah, we needed it during the course of the project outside of those part of the project, uh, particularly industry members, providing us with valuable data. And we were very grateful to them to help make it possible. And we're also extremely grateful to our project officer, Dirk Schaefer, because he understands two important things about exploratory research. Number one, it's research. And number two, it's exploratory. And he understood that we were feeling our way a little bit as we went along. And we had to be a little bit adaptive as we came across a few problems in deciding what we're going to do next and how things were going to work. And Dirk was always supporting us when he could see we were trying to reach the best quality we could in the research program, as well as giving us nice, timely feedback on our deliverables. So we, we thank you very much for, for that, which was much appreciated, very sincerely. The last slide from me, I couldn't resist putting one in of uh, Rosetta. I won't go into very long. There are a couple of analogies with our project from Rosetta. First of all, we started planning the project in about mid-2011. We put the proposal in in the 18th of October 2012. The contract was signed a year. I don't know what happened. It took about a year. We signed the contract. And three years later, we're standing here with some numbers to show you. So the project took just over about half the amount of time that the Rosetta mission was actually baseball. So it's taken quite a long time. It's also had a few bumps along the way, but I think we pretty much entirely enjoyed it. We didn't end up crash landing on a comet at the end, so that's probably quite a good outcome. And for sure, we have a lot of data, which is now sitting there ready for further exploration. And we just hope to give you a little bit of an insight into some of the early data analyses during the course of today. So that was the bit from me. So now I'm going to hand over to the two guys who did a massive amount of the work on the project to take you through the results and something on the model implementation. So next is over to Lewis Dargada. Thanks, Andrew, for a very clear introduction of the project. As you can see, we are going to present like what is the model and all the different bits of it and then some results, conclusions, and as Andrew said, we have quite a lot of ideas how we can extend this work or different things that can be analyzed, so that we'll be covering finally on the future research. An overview of the model in general. You can see there in the corner on the top that it's the little image that Andrew was using to show or how the system works, so we are going to cover those different pieces. Mainly, we have developed a layer network, a stochastic layer network to run the simulation. So we have different layers where we have the mechanisms, we have the flights with the traffic, we have the passengers with the different itineraries that are going to be modeled. And Samu will expand a little bit more about the implementation on that. Then we have, um, within all the stochasticity of the system, we are adding the disturbances, specific disturbances that has been modeled, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. As Andrew was mentioning, for us it's very important to have what is the cost, because we are focusing on what is the cost of the investment, but also what we are getting back. So we are getting the cost allocation for the different passengers in terms of cost of delay that will be computed for the airlines. The data mainly we have focused on a given day, and we have developed the traffic on that day. We selected a day in September. In theory, it was very easy because it was just a day where nothing happened, just a lot of traffic. And in practice, it took quite a lot of time just to find one day where nothing happened and there was a lot of traffic. So we have one busy Friday from September 2014 as the baseline. We are covering 200 airports within the ECAC area and 50 beyond. All the data in terms of traffic comes from the DDR information for the flights. Then we have complemented that with information in terms of airspace and also capacity and passengers. The passengers are based on previous work, but we have uh, expanded that work that was done within POEM in order to allocate the new passengers itineraries for this particular day. 
For the disruptions, we have based them on a specific disruptions that happened in the network in the past to be as close as possible as what would happen if such disruptions happen. So let's talk a little bit about the different mechanisms. After quite a lot of work and selecting more than 25 different mechanisms, we shortlist them to these four. We have improving sector capacity with ad co-hours, dynamic cost indexing, ACDN, and improved passenger reaccommodation tools. We have analyzed different criteria. One of them is the location where the mechanisms apply. The two first are mainly applied when the flights are during the route phase, while ACDM and improved passenger accommodation are at an airport level. Then we have look also at how complex they are in terms of development. Some of them, we analyze them as basic because they don't require like interaction of different stakeholders. Like for example, having improved passenger reaccommodation, you just have to implement that within the airline and then you have that system. While with ACDM, you have all the different methodology associated, not only the technology. As you can see, the focus is different. We think that some of them are more targeting to mitigate a problem. Like for example, with dynamic cost indexing, we have a plane that is delayed and we try to mitigate that delay. Or improving sector capacity with ADCO hours, we have a problem with capacity, we put controllers. So we are targeting a specific problems. While others are mechanisms that are running in the background and are helping to solve disruptions, but they are not targeted to a very specific disruption, such as for example, ACDM. Also, it's interesting to notice that some of them are focusing on the delay, try to reduce delay. That's why we have put the magnitude of the delay, while others are run by the cost. So the airline is deciding the best, the one that is giving, in theory, the best cost from a given set of options. Finally, it's interesting to see that even if we are focusing on the benefit that the airlines are getting mainly by estimating the cost of delay, the investment cost the primary investment can be done by different stakeholders, such as the NSPs or the airports, even if in some cases that cost may end up going back to the airline in terms of charges, for example. Let's look a little bit in detail, each one of them, about the different costs and how we have implemented them. As you can see, for improving sector with ADCO hours, in the baseline, we are assuming that the NSPs are not implementing these mechanisms, so there is nothing to do. We are just going to go run the disruptions as nowadays. What the mechanism does is that we are assuming that some of the air traffic flow management regulations that exist could be mitigated if the NSPs has a better system to manage the staffing, such as clearly regulations that are triggered due to a staff shortage. Those type of regulations can be mitigated if we have the mechanism in place. And also we have assumed that some areas in the airspace are going to get an increase in demand because planes are trying to reroute about disrupted areas. And that may generate regulations in those airspaces as a knock-on effect. Those NSPs may manage that disruption by increasing their controllers. So the idea for the implementation will be to reduce the air traffic flow management in those regions. For the implementation, for the early adopters, there is no strategic cost as we assume that they already have the system in place to be able to do this. For the followers, we have a range of values between one and three millions based on the NSP size. For the tactical cost, what we are assuming is that when we add controllers, we are adding a shift of controllers, so seven hour shift. The cost is based on the reported ADCO hours cost, is the tactical cost of having those controllers working. How many controllers are needed in order to mitigate the disruption? We have done an estimate looking at how many controllers are available in average in the NSPs that we are interested in, and what is the maximum that we have seen that exists there. So that gives us what is the gap in terms of controllers that the NSP could put in place in a tactical way, if that were possible. So this is just to give you an idea about how we have done the scaling of the strategic cost. It's based on the number of ad cores that we have seen in operation of the different NSPs, and we have scaled the strategic cost of implementing this mechanism. And for the tactical cost, as I said, we are basing on the ATM cost efficiency reports. That is the average, the difference we have seen in terms of controllers for the NSPs, where we have assumed that this mechanism could be in place. As Andrew mentioned, it's important to see that we have the uptake. So in the baseline, no one is implementing these mechanisms. In early adopters, we are assuming that the UK and MUAC are implementing the mechanism. For the followers, we are expanding that to Germany, Poland, France, and Spain. Okay. Then for dynamic cost index, in order to model nowadays operations, what we have done is that there is a basic rule of thumb when planes are delayed. And that rule is that 10% of the flights that are longer than an hour, if they are delayed more than 15 minutes, then they will try to recover that delay by speeding up. 
that recovery we have bounded by a given maximum amount of fuel that can be used to avoid like unrealistic fuel consumptions. When we implement these mechanisms, what we are assuming is that the airline has a clever system that when a plane is delayed and reaches the top of climb, there is an assessment of how much would it cost to recover part of the delay. So what we are doing is to recover the delay by discrete blocks. For every recovery possibility, the total amount of fuel that will be used to do that is assessed. So that's giving us what is the best strategy, what is the best thing that the airline could do for every individual flight when it reaches the top of climb. As we are assuming also that we are changing the cost index, as you well know, the whole trajectory should be changed, not just the speed during the cruise. So we have estimated by how much the cruise will increase because we are increasing the cost index in a tactical way. With consultation from industry for the tactical cost of that, we are assuming a percentage with respect to the net saving that the airline is estimating that it's going to have, because that's uh, one of the ways that they are charged for these sort of systems. Then for the strategic cost, we have two costs. One is related with the training of the pilots and the crew, and the other one will be for the upgrading of the systems in the plane in order to have the technology to allow to do these sort of operations. Just a few notes in terms of the training of the pilots. What we have done is estimate which percentage of the pilots within the airline will require the training when we move from the different phases of early adopters and followers. So it's not everyone that gets the training, but just the one that required, and similarly for the implementation of the systems within the flights. For the uptake, as I said, for the baseline, as we are just doing this rule of thumb of recovering delay when, when I'm late by speeding up, all the flights that are longer than an hour have the possibility to do it. And then for this advanced way of managing delay, what we have done is for the early adopter, assume that the three top ECA airports hub carriers are doing these sort of operations for the flights that are to and from their hubs. So we have British Airways have Heathrow, Lufthansa, uh, Frankfurt, and Air France uh, charge the goal. And then in the followers, those airlines are going to expand this type of operation for the whole network, while we have on the other five big airports with the main carriers that are doing these operations on their operations to and from the hub. So we have Turkish Airways, uh, KLM, Alitalia, SAS and Swiss. Then by judgmental selection, we have add also EasyJet, Welling and Iberia on their operations from their main airport. For ACDM, by looking at some literature, we have seen that one of the benefits of adding ACDM is that the reactionary delay may be reduced, and that reduction has been estimated between 3 and 4%. So in the baseline case, we are assuming that the airports that are implementing ACDM are achieving that reduction in average of 3% of the propagation of the delay when we have reactionary delay at the airport. When we move to the early adopters, those airports, we are assuming that are enhancing their operations, so they are moving from this center in 3% reduction to a center in 4% reduction. And the new airports that are incorporated will start at this 3%. And then when we move to the followers, those early adopters will enhance to the 4%, while the new airports that are at will go at a 3% reduction of the reactionary delay. For the airports that don't have the ACDM implemented, there is a strategic cost that mainly is going to be bound by the airports, even if there is some investment by the airlines. And the tactical cost, uh, as you can see, again, it has a big part related with the airports and some investment by the airline. But as you can see, we have applied a factor, and that factor of 0.35% is to dilute the tactical cost of the whole year to only one day. And that percentage represents like, the amount of traffic we have in the day under study, because we want the cost to be comparable across the mechanisms. So we are just doing the cost for that day of operation tactically. As Andrew mentioned, we have looked at the Eurocontrol website to see which airports have ACDM and how they are developing it. So in the baseline, we have these airports here implementing ACDM. For the early adopters, we added those ones there. And for the followers, we add the rest that are in the process of implementing ACDM. The final mechanisms that we have analyzed is the improved passenger reaccommodation tool. In this case, this is a mechanism that is going to be applied mainly for airlines that have connecting passengers. In the nowadays operations, what we are doing, it's a local airport by airport solution. This means that when a passenger misses a connection at the airport, the system assesses which is the best way to reallocate that passenger. So if we should put it in the next flight, or if we should uh, pay to a different airline to carry it, or reroute it through a different airport if it's a three-legger, for example. But that's done at an airport by airport, and it's done just reallocating the passengers and looking at the cost. And of course, very importantly, looking at the cost of Regulation 261 for compensation for passenger delay.
in the advanced system, when we implement the mechanism, what we are assuming is that we still have that. We have the possibility to reroute the passengers and rebook them in the following flights. But also, the airline is going to assess for the outbound flights, if it's worth it or not, to wait for connecting passengers that may miss their connections. So what we have done is to do 50 minute increment wait for time and assess what will be the cost of waiting for those connecting passengers that may miss the connections otherwise if the outbound flight departs on time. The reactionary effect of that has been also assessed, so the cost in theory is assessed to make the best decision at that time for those passengers. In the early adopter case, there is no cost strategically because for consultation with industry, they will already have a system that allow them to manage the passengers and this will be an upgrade on the system and it will not be charged in terms of as a one-off investment. However, it will be charged in the tactical way because there is a fixed fee per passenger board. For the followers, we are assuming that they require to acquire the system, so there is a cost that we got also from consultancy with industry. In terms of the uptake, we have uh, mimic what we have done with the DCI. So what we have is uh, for the early adopters, it will be the main carriers in Heathrow, Frankfurt, and Paris, operating in operations two from the hub, then expanding to the whole network, and so on. So it's exactly the same. And that's in terms of the different models. So as you can see, it's quite detailed, the four different mechanisms. And as I said, we started with more than 25. We reduced it to those four. Then in terms of disturbances, as we all know, we have the different airports, we have the different flights going through the network, and things are not ideal, we have delay, mainly. What is important is that we have background air traffic flow management delay. And in that case, we mean that even if we don't put a specific disturbance, there is going to be delay in terms of air traffic flow management, and that needs to be captured in the model. Then explicitly, we can model disturbances that are going to have a specific scope in terms of location and duration and impact on the flight. So we have two different disturbances. For the background air traffic flow management delay, as we are using one day that was a baseline where nothing major happened, there was not a strike, there was not a big thunderstorm or anything like that, we have assumed that that's a good baseline as a background air traffic flow management delay that we can have in a normal day. We have kept the same delay that was on that day in terms of our traffic flow management delay. But of course, we don't want to assign it to the same planes all the time. So what we have done is to compute which planes potentially go through the different regulations on that day. And then we have a delay pool with all the delay that happened on that day. And we assign that delay to the different flights with a process. So mainly what we are doing is shuffling a little bit the delay that happened on that day within the different traffic. Then for the particular disturbances that we were considering, as you all know, the disturbances described by the type of disturbance they are, their frequency of occurrence, location, duration, and intensity. So the location and duration will be the scope of the regulation. And in the different type, originally, we assessed different type of disturbance we could consider, from weather to ash plums or uh, passenger disruption, technical failures, and so on. And after quite a lot of work looking at different data, we decided to select weather and industrial actions. Industrial actions were more common than one may think, and they are very disruptive. So we thought that it was a very good way of having that. While weather is generally more spread in the network, maybe it's different type of disturbance with different effects, and that was interesting for the project. So these are the ones we selected. Maybe the mechanisms behave differently if the disruption is in one area in Europe and the rest of the network is more or less okay. Or if those disruptions maybe are similar in magnitude, but they are spread through the whole network. So we look at two different scopes, one local and one dispersed. And as I said, we are based them on historical disturbance because we want to have a realistic delay added to the system. For industrial actions, we are based them on two different days where industrial actions were present. One is the local scope and the dispersed one. We're going to see this in the next slide a little bit more in detail. What we did is to mimic the air traffic flow management regulations that were on those days. So for all the traffic that crosses those regulations, there is a probability of getting delay assigned that it's 25% uh, per regulation that is crossed. We have uh, fitted the delay 
following a given distribution to generate our traffic flow management delay for those flights. And of course, with industrial actions, it's very important to model cancellations and reroutings because they represent quite a lot of disrupting in the system when we have this type of disturbances. It's possible to do a routing around the, the regulation. This is the one we selected for the local, and as you can see, it's localized in France, but the rest of Europe, it's all right. And then when we move to the dispersed one, when we are like trying to cover more of a dispersed uh, regulation, we are getting the 30th of January, where we still have France, but now also we have disruptions in Central Europe and in Portugal, so it's a little bit more spread. There was quite a lot of work also in terms of which day to select and how we have done that. For weather, we have again air traffic flow management regulation due to weather, and we have two different types and the airspace at that airport. So we have different probabilities for both, but we also have to consider delay that is not related to air traffic flow management, because if we have bad weather, maybe there are no regulations, but there is still delay because the system is not performing as it should. That has also been captured and modeled within the system. In this case, for the local and dispersed, we have also taken into account two different things. In the local, we are looking at a day where the problem was mainly at the airports, and with the dispersed, we are looking at a day where the problems were mainly en route. Therefore, when we are looking at the local weather disruption, rerouting is not a possibility because the problem is at the airport, so we cannot go around the regulations because we have to get to our final destination. So this is the day where we are doing the localized uh, problem, and as you can see, it's mainly localized around Germany and at the different airports and Switzerland. Then in the dispersed one, it's a little bit more spread through the rest of Europe. I have mentioned several times that we allow the possibility to do reroutings. What we have done is pre-compute for every flight that goes through the different regulations, what will be the route that could be taken to avoid it. So here you have a couple of examples. We have a flight from Barcelona going to North uh, England, and as you can see, there is this industrial action going on in France. So the submitted flight plan is the green one, but the one that will avoid the regulation is that one here in blue. And same, you can see here where we are avoiding that area. This has been computed using a typical A star short path uh, algorithm, analyzing the possible routes for the day. That's why here you can see also the black one that is the short, that is there is no disruption. One interesting thing is that we are doing this, then we are putting more pressure in Spain, we are putting more pressure in Italy because we are shifting the traffic from their original demand. What we have assumed is that there is a probability to be in delay even if you reroute because those areas may in turn generate delay. For example, if we look at the industrial actions in the local scope, we have that, the regulations in France, they are not all at the same time on, as you know, it's a temporal opening and closing of different regulations, so we have to take that into account too, which regulations are active when the flight is going to be operated. If we compute that everyone reroute, what we can see is that France, there is a drop in demand of uh, that amount of kilometers that goes down in terms of flights that want to fly within France. That makes sense. But then there are all these other areas that increase the demand because we have more flights going through. So what we have done is to assume that there is going to be a probability of getting delay in the UK, in Spain and in Italy when more regulations are active during that industrial action. We have done the same for the despair case for industrial actions. We have the different times where the regulations are on. We have the areas that will go down in demand if traffic go around and the area that will increase demand if that happens. In a similar way, we have applied that for the weather. And as you can see, that's when the weather is active in terms of regulations. This is the areas that will decrease the demand, the areas that will increase otherwise. And as I said, there is no for local weather because the regulations are at the airport. So no rerouting is possible. So this type of delay has been applied for these airspaces at those times. It's a dynamic process also, and it's giving us a probability of getting delay assigned for those flights. Finally, we are interested in the cost, so what we are looking is at the tactical cost, taking into account the reactionary delays and considering the cost of delay for fleet, fuel, crew, maintenance and also passengers. So there was a consultation with a legal experts on Regulation 261 in order to model as best as possible what will be the cost for the airlines. And those values have been updated to 2014 values from previous work. For the fuel that we need for the model, 
We have estimated using BADA models. We have estimated the different phases of the flights based on DDR data and the submitted flight plan. And an average weight and cruise wind during the cruise has been estimated for each one of the flights. We have validated sort of like with some data from Airbus also. And so from some Airbus aircraft, we have seen that the fuel that we are modeling are quite close to the real fuel consumption or realistic fuel consumption. So we are very pleased with that. In order to have the model, we need the flights moving, but we need the passengers with the connections. There is the passenger itineraries. The traffic is based on that day with all these airports that I mentioned before. We have restored the flights to the original schedule because, of course, in the data they are already impacted, but whatever happened on that day. And then we have passenger data that comes from different sources. We have 2010 itineraries coming from previous projects of POEM. We have 2014 GDS data, and we have also 2010 PAXIS data. We have the traffic data for 2014, and we have some data to do the calibration coming from industry, like uh, ACI Europe, Eurostar passenger flows, and airline load factors. So we need to combine all these to get individual passengers. So the idea is for all the passengers itineraries possible, looking at the traffic, we have compute what are the possible options for each one of the itineraries. Then we have to score those options because maybe you are changing between different alliances or between different partners if you are doing connections. So the different options will have a different score. Then we need to assign those itineraries to individual flights. So we need to know how many passengers we need to put there. So we need to estimate the load factors based on the calibration data for each one of the individual flights. And that's going to give us what is the capacity available we have for each one of the flights. And then it's the process of doing that assignment. Of course, when we do that, we may end up with some flights that are too full because we have put too many passengers. So there is a process of capacity evaluation to make sure that we are meeting the targets of low factors we want. That's going to recompute what is the capacity available that we have at that time. And then we can reassign the itineraries that still need to be assigned. So it's an iterative process. We have new routes in 2014 that are not captured by the itineraries. So we need to generate uh, itineraries for those uh, flights. And finally, as we are mixing data from 2010 and 2014, there is a fair adjustment to make sure that the itineraries uh, and the fare of the passengers meet 2014 data. So we have uh, over 26,000 flights, considering that we are only looking at flights with passengers with a seat capacity of 4.5 million and different load factors. So we have estimated 3.8 million itineraries that we need, passengers that we need, with an overall load factor of 84%. With that, we have all the pieces. Now we have the traffic, we have the itineraries, so we can run the model with the background traffic from management delay. We can put the disruptions if we want, and we can put the different mechanisms on to estimate what are the different costs. We needed to calibrate that, so let's look at some numbers on the calibration. These values are the targets that we were trying to get in terms of flight departure delay, arrival delay, reactionary delay, and so on. And those are the baseline values that we are getting if we don't put the disruption. So we are quite pleased with the calibration, which implies quite a lot of manual adjustment also of some parameters. In terms of the passengers, you can see here the division between direct flights, one connection and two connection. Those are the targets from industry. The values we are getting are also very close. In total, we have 3.7 million, over 3.7 million of individual passengers assigned to the different flights. The load factors, these are the values coming from industry, and we are meeting a load factor of 83.5 overall. As I said, the load factors are individual per flights. We have generated them. They are within the target of what we want. Finally, all the different scenarios we have done, mainly is the crossing between the mechanisms and the disturbances. The only thing you have to keep into account is that for each one of the mechanisms we have actually two uptakes, and for DCI we have done it twice. Once with a nominal fuel scenario and one with a high fuel scenario to try to see the sensibility of fuel price with respect to that mechanism. So in total that gives us 40 scenarios. So now Samu will talk about the implementation of the model. Just to continue, I hope you are all on track with Luis' presentation. I mean, he has been presenting this for 30 minutes, but it took us a few years to get to this point. Now, I want to turn into how you go from all this theory of the model to something that software you can actually run and compute. So I wasn't sure if there are many software developers in this room. Are there any? Okay, at least we got a couple. Okay, former is also fine. So I will try
try to keep it like very short and good so you don't have to really go into details of the implementation but I want to tell you why this is important and why it's not as simple as just getting everything Luis said and then put it into the computer and then run it and see what happens, right? Basically, in the model, complexity cost model, we have a lot of elements interacting and this, this is like short list. I think Luis also presented something similar. We have one network manager, Europe, and then we have like between 30, 50 or navigator. We have thousand airlines, whatever, and hundreds airports and around 30K flights and three million passengers a day. The elements of the system are basically limited by the three million passengers, so you have to model each single passenger or itinerary inside the model. So the model accounts for individual passenger and itineraries. And also we want to do it with a time resolution of one minute at least, so no less. That gives you like a lot of elements in the system, but also we have like 55 scenarios because I think the previous table was like four mechanisms plus an extra mechanism, which is just the fuel analysis for sensitivity with higher prices. And then we have like two level of uptake for the stakeholders, which was this thing about early adopters and followers, plus the baseline scenario, so this is 55. Then, because this is a random model, so we have to run it several times to get the distributions to, I mean, it's kind of Monte Carlo simulations, so you run it, run it, run it, until your metrics are somehow confident enough to say, okay, this is the number of rooms that I need. We run it between 20 and 50 because we got like the figures we wanted were in a very good confidence level with this number of runs. Yeah, it depends on the scenario. Some scenarios are more heavy computational requirements, so it took longer. So that's the thing that there are different numbers. With all this, you have like 2K simulation runs, which means like executions of the model of this 3 million element system. So if you're running it at real time, it would take like five years. So you need to do something like fast time or whatever, but still you need to reduce it by thousand to one in the time scale reduction. And it's not that easy, okay? That's the <laughs> bottom line. Okay, so we ended up trying to find the best way to simulate this and construct this software. And this is the three elements that I want you to keep in your mind. So the elements that constitute the model. I will talk a little bit about each of them. First thing we did was to use this uh, event-driven simulation or this great event simulation. So we didn't model time on continuous. We just t simulate things when things happen, okay? So we have like timestamps when something happened and then you simulate something and then you continue, but you don't run the whole timeline, more or less. I will go into detail for that. Then we have the mesoscopic scale. This means that we don't model every detail of the system. So we don't go to a micro approach or neither a macro approach. So we are somehow in the middle. Some things are modeled like very detailed because we wanted to have everything in there so we can change parameters or we can control it. But some of the things like taxi times, we just take values from Coda thing and then build a distribution and then pick like random samples for that. So that's definitely faster than trying to simulate all the moves from the aircraft on the, on the flight. But on the other hand, for instance, for the passengers, we model like very precisely when do they arrive to the gates and if the aircraft wait or doesn't wait for them because that was part of the rules and we really want to keep control of that. So it's just not enough using random distribution. The last thing is this HPC, high performance computing, is that we use parallel computing because in the way you use event-driven simulation and the mesoscopic scale, you can run this event, well, these small processes in parallel, so you can speed up simulation. And we also deployed everything on cloud, so we can escalate and put more machines. I mean, as long as you pay, you can pull like a lot of hardware and it will, it will run faster. So let's go for the first, to the event-driven simulation. So basically what you have is um, something which are called events, which are small processes, and then you have like a huge stack. We control all these processes. So you just take their process in time. So you take one of these events, then you run it into something, environment, and then the event will trigger more events that will put into the stack, and then you get the lower one. These events are things like taking off or asking for the departure slot or missing a connection on whatever. So you have something like I call actors. And this is similar to agent-based modeling, but it's not the same. So this is in between both uh, fields. Okay, from one hand, you have this event-driven simulation. At some point, you can have more than one stack, and you can still move the events and work with this. But let's assume you have only one. The thing is that each of these events is controlled by one actor, and then you have one action in the system. And these actors have a series of definition parameters, some of them are static, dynamic, and then the important thing here is that there are two levels, one level for the events and how you manage them, 
and how the events trigger new events, and then you have another level, which is the actor level. So the actors will never go into the event level or otherwise. And events cannot communicate between them. They are more or less independent. All the communication is made through the channels provided by the actors. This will allow you to change actors inside the same system without changing the processes or change the processes without changing the actors. So we want to keep things separated and um, we created this language hierarchy when you have like program languages and then you are not allowed to call functions from the events, from the actors or vice versa. So you can have this in separated into different layers. Yeah, this was the approach for the implementation. For the um, computing, basically what we had is um, we have a main driver that keep all the scenarios, all the simulation runes, and then all the stacks, all the event stacks, and then it selects the stack, and then it's sent into a pool of machines that were deployment in Amazon, and selects which machine is free, and then send the event, the process, the algorithm, and then the machine works it out. In the meantime, maybe another machine is working on the event, on the processes, small sort of processes, and when one, one machine is finished with this, it's not exactly a machine, it's a thread inside of a computer, but whatever, then it goes back to the driver, the driver just consolidate all the results and start constructing your final metrics or distribution for your indicators. It's implemented in MATLAB, current release, 2060. We also use Jira Agile, especially at the end of the project for the develop, and GitHub to keep control of the code and then Amazon to deploy everything on the cloud. Some figures, this is like estimators. Well, some of them. We have like 10,000 lines of code, around 1K of functions, hundreds of megabytes input, output of gigabytes. Then we have like terabytes of memory used, and there's the maximum number of threads, and 10 to the 19th, which is in the range of the peta scale, which is pretty good. It's farther away from the current maximum, but still hard enough. Yeah, that was pretty short. <laughs> that was it. And I think Luis continue with the results. Thank you, Sam. It was very concise and clear. <laughs> all this, all the model, and then what do we get at the end? <laughs> results and conclusions. First thing, in terms of cost, here you can see for early adopters and followers, what are the strategic and tactical costs. For confidential reasons, there are some values we cannot show because they have been shared within the industry. We have revealed them to Dirk, so under demand, we can always like, see them. But the idea will be that the values for DCI are in the same order of magnitude of the other two mechanisms. And then for the tactical cost, one thing that was quite interesting is like for DCI, when the fuel is higher, the cost tends to decrease in around 10%, and that's in proportion with the increase in fuel we have done. And it's because the decision of speeding up or not, or what is the best strategy at the top of climb, it's taking into account what will be the cost and what will be the benefit we are getting by doing that speed up. So less flies are going to decide to do that, because it's more expensive, because the cost of fuel is higher. Then in terms of the cost resilience that Andrew presented before, these are the values we got for the industrial actions simulations. The first thing we can see is that the values are comparable between them, which is good, because that's what we want from this type of metric that allow us to compare the different mechanisms at the different options. If we look between the early adopters and the followers, we can see that when we increase uh, the number of stakeholders that are implemented in the mechanisms, the resilient value goes up for the improved sector capacity, which is something good because we have more people implementing the mechanism then we are getting a better cost resilient from that. And we are getting also an increase when we are in the dispersed scenarios. Then if we look for the DCI, we can see again that we have that effort, we have an increase, which is uh, good and is what we will expect when there is more operations that are doing these advanced mechanisms of deciding if it's speeding up or not, we get a better outcome. However, for ACDM, we don't see that, nor will we see it for the improved uh, passenger reaccommodation. And that was quite a surprise. We didn't expect that to happen. However, it makes sense when we think that ACDM, for example, is not coupled with the disturbances. Like, for example, when we are doing the improved sector capacity for DCI, if we are having a higher tactical cost, that means that that NSP or those flights are speeding up because they are solving a problem. 
while in ACDM we are just investing more money on all the other airports and maybe in those airports nothing is happening so we are just having a higher cost but we are not getting a direct benefit because that mechanism is not targeting a specific disturbance and maybe there is not a well coupling between the disturbance we have put and where they are located the distributions and the distribution of the mechanism so that's interesting and it shows that the metric it's uh, showing us that type of relationships for improved passenger reaccommodation we have a little bit the same issue but there is something else behind that we will be able to see once we look at the other disaggregated metrics that uh, we think justify the fact that having a wider network operating this uh, mechanism is not performing as well as when we have a smaller subset of planes selected ones that are the one applying on the mechanism. The other thing that is quite interesting is that if we look at the DCI for nominal fuel and for high fuel, we will expect that if the cost of fuel is higher, then the mechanism is going to perform worse. But actually, we don't see that. The values are comparable and they are actually statistically the same. There is no difference. The metric is showing that there is a decoupling between the cost of fuel and the performance of the mechanisms. Again, this is something interesting and that we can get from the metric because what is happening, as I said before, is that you have a higher cost of fuel, but that means that the mechanism is performing as we expect and less plays are going to recover delay because it has a higher cost so we are like trading what is the benefit we are having with what is the cost of doing that and the performance uh, across is the same so that was a nice uh, result if we move to the weather disturbance these are the values that we have here for the different resilience once again they are comparable among them we can see that as in the previous one the improved servitor capacity it's uh, performing better it seems the resilience value we are getting is higher than for the other mechanisms for comparison i have put the two of them one above the other so those are the results for industrial action scenarios and these are the ones for for weather and as you can see the values across are comparable and they are they are in the same order which means that there is not a very big difference between the type of disturbance at least for these mechanisms and at least for the type of uh, disturbance and mechanisms we have been modeling in, in these uh, scenarios. One reason we think why the improved setter capacity is performing better than the other mechanisms, as you can see, that in general their cost resilience is higher, is because first it's targeting a given problem. We only have a cost, as I said before, if there is a disturbance and that gets solved by that. But also that mechanism from the ones we have implemented is the only one that is removing air traffic flow management delay directly. So it's removing primary delay from the network. And by doing that, we are getting a better cost benefit. While the others, they are just trying to recover part of the delay, but they are not reducing or eliminating the delay originally. To understand better the cost resilience, like why are we getting these values, as Andrew said, we have computed hundreds of metrics from passenger and flight-centric metric and cost-centric metrics but here we are showing just a selection of them. These values are computed in average with all the different scenarios and all the different simulations. We have here the different mechanisms and the different metrics. The two first that are flight centric, we have the flight departure delay and the flight arrival delay. In the flight departure delay, one interesting thing is if we compare to that 10.2, that 10.2 is the value we got when we did the calibration of the system. And remember that in that calibration, we didn't have disturbances. So the values you can see, they are higher, which is what we would expect. We are putting disturbance so we get a higher departing delay. However, the improved sector capacity is performing better than the others. It gives us a lower value that we see reflected on the arrival delay. Nothing is happening in between. We are just removing delay. And this is what I said before. We are also targeting primary delay by removing delay in the system. So the departing delay that we are seeing in that mechanism is lower. While on the other hand, we have the improved passenger reaccommodation that has a higher arrival delay. And that higher arrival delay mimics the higher departing delay. And it's something we will expect because what we are doing is delaying planes so that people don't miss the connection. So we are departing later and we are not putting any mechanism to improve that flight. So if it's departing later, it's generally arriving with a higher delay. When we look at the passenger arrival delay, the improved sector capacity is the one that is performing the best. However, this may be linked with the fact that there is a huge amount of passengers that are one leg. They are just doing one flight. So if the delay of the flight goes down, we are getting a lower passenger arrival delay, which is linked with why we are getting a lower cost per flight. But well, when we look only to the flights that have been delayed, it's also the one that is performing the best. And once again, I think we think it's related with that fact that we are removing the delay directly. However, when we look at the passenger over the flight delay, now, not surprisingly, the improved passenger reaccommodation is the one performing the best. Because that mechanism is the one that is dealing with passengers that are missing their connections. They are no longer missing their connections, so the overall ratio is better. 
as you can see, the performance for flights is different than the performance for passengers in this case. And there is a trade-off behind on what is the delay that single leg passengers are having and passengers with connections are having. That's what we can see there. Surprisingly, it's the one that is having the higher reactionary delay. Because in theory, we were considering that the fact that the plane is assessing if waiting or not should take into account the propagation of that delay. But as you can see here, there are problems in the network that maybe has not been taken completely into account. And one of the things that is happening is that we have a plane that maybe it's waiting and then gets a regulation on top of that. While if it departed, that regulation may not have happened. So we are having a propagation of the delay through the network due to how the mechanism has been implemented. I will talk about that in future work, about things we can do to try to enhance that. When we look at uh, environment metrics in terms of fuel burn and emissions, em emissions are proportional to the fuel burn, we can see, not surprisingly, that DCI is the one that is performing the best. And in this case, it's because it's the only mechanism that is targeting what is the fuel that we are using during the flight. So that's what we will expect from it. We are getting the same benefit for the emissions. But when we look at the at gate emissions, once again, the improved passenger reaccommodation is the one with the higher value. And that's because you have the planes waiting for the passenger connecting. So there is more emissions that are produced while those planes are on ground. One thing we have uh, assessed, finally, is a preliminary assessment of the period needed to recover the strategic cost, the strategic investment. These values are in months, so the first thing that is interesting is that the values are relatively low, which is good, which means that in a relatively low period of time we can recover the strategic investment for the mechanisms. They are taking into account already the dilution of the traffic, because we were doing a very busy day, so if, if it were a normal day, that's already taken into account. But it's counting days with disruptions such as the one we have modeled. So when we see here one month it's required, it means one month where we have disruptions such as the ones that we have modeled in the system. For ACDM, the value is much higher, we have a 10, but in mind that in this case we are taking into account that we are recovering the whole investment of the strategic investment of ACDM that is mainly put by the airports with the benefit that is getting just the airlines because we are only looking at the cost of the delay for the airlines. So if we only look at what is the investment for the airlines, we get these values that are much more in line with what the other mechanisms are. For passenger reaccommodations, we have a zero there. And if you remember, for early adopter, we are assuming that it's just a software upgrade and that will have a very low cost. So it's recovered immediately in terms of strategic cost. That's all in terms of the results. We were mentioning before we have quite a lot of other metrics, but we haven't present here on the results. Then in terms of the conclusions, we have the cost resilience that has been assessed. We have done that for four mechanisms with phase stakeholders and with explicitly modeled local and dispersed disturbances for weather and industrial actions. We have uh, considered flight, passenger, and cost-centric metrics. Once again, it has been proven that we cannot just look at flight metrics. We need to look at least also at passenger ones because the delay that passengers experience is different than the delay that flights individually do. The results are fully cost and we have done a very extensive industry consultation to try to get the best values possible in terms of strategic but also of uh, tactical cost for all these different mechanisms. And what I just mentioned, that passenger centric metrics has been once again corroborated through this project. In terms of the cost resilient metric, we are happy with it because it has been developed, tested, and proved that it's sensible to the different results that we have. It behaves logically, even if we didn't expect some of the values originally, but that's part of uh, why we think it's nice because it's showing us things that we are learning through the metric. And therefore, we think it's a very interesting metric in terms of high level performance indicators that could be applied in the future for other mechanisms, type of disruptions, or projects. So that leads us to the further research. We have different bits. We can enhance the model, the input and cost assignment, the disturbance and the mechanisms, and finally also how we are doing all this analysis. So in terms of the implementation, the first thing we could do is to expand the area that is covered or one of the things we can do. We can add more airports outside the ones from the ECAC or we can even do a completely different region. The stakeholders that we have, we can expand it. We can add different stakeholders, see what are their costs, what will be their benefits and apply this sort of metrics through them. Then, as I mentioned, there was quite a lot of work in terms of calibration of the model to make sure that we have a model that mimics what's happening in the network. And that could be auto-calibrated with a little bit of work in terms of uh, the implementation that someone was mentioning before. And some sensitivity analysis could be done in that way. One very interesting feature that someone didn't mention is that in the implementation we have passenger level itineraries and so on. But we also have passenger level logs information of everything that is happening. So we can see 
every flight, all the information, all the passengers and so on, which is really good, but it also generates a lot of uh, output and it makes it very hard to do the debugging and the analysis of the validation. So a visual tool could be developed to help in that process. The event stack that Samu was mentioned could be parallel and then we can link those event stack closer to the different actors. We will take us closer to an agent-based uh, mechanism paradigm and that will be a step forward in terms of uh, developing that. Some of the process, as Samu said, we are at a meso level, for example the taxi in, we just have a distribution of what is the taxi based on CODA data. We could if we wanted or if we think it's interesting or needed or for different mechanisms maybe interesting to go more into a level of detail like passengers moving within terminals for do the connections or those sort of things. So we can enhance that type of uh, model. In terms of data, the reroutings, we have computed a given probability of doing the rerouting proportional to how much longer the flight is going to be and so on, but more data will be required in terms to improve, enhance how that decision is done by the airlines. In the passenger fare and preference data, if we have better information on the passengers, that will help on the process of generating the itineraries because we can take into account what is the fare, what is the type of passenger, in the preference of which flight we're assigning them, for example. One thing that I didn't mention is that that process of assigning the itineraries is not deterministic. It's not that we run it and that's it, but it has also some stochasticity in terms of where do we assign the passengers. So instead of doing it once, we did it a given amount of time. We cannot have only one assignment of passengers, but an ensemble of passengers for that day. And then we can run the models with different distribution of passengers and see what is the effect in terms of the metrics. So that will be a, another thing we could do. For the disturbances, talking with airlines, one of the things they do a lot, as you well know, is flight level capping to avoid regulations. We have taken into account routing, but we haven't modeled flight level capping. And that will be relatively easy if we just model it as an extra fuel consumption that appears if the flight is doing that strategy, for example. We can estimate the regulations differently because we can enhance how we are doing that. In the industrial action models, the airlines where they are reacting towards that, one of the things they tell us they, they sometimes do is be more proactive in terms of shifting operations, like moving traffic to do different type of routes or crew doing different things. We could model that also into the system. We haven't got to that level of detail. And similarly for the weather model and the passenger disruption, because it will be interesting to include disruption that have a higher impact in terms of regulation to 6.1, and therefore maybe the enhanced way of allocating passengers to flights will have a better performance because that will have a higher cost for, for airlines. For the mechanisms, ACDM, the delay, now we have done the improvement between 3 and 4% that could be enhanced with different distributions. We can coordinate the ACDM with the arrival manager, the departure manager, that will be linked with the fact of doing more micro-level modeling of different bits of the system. For DCI, we can explicitly model flight level changes and not just standing the flight level. The passenger heuristic, as I said, one of the things we have seen with the waiting or not for passengers is that it has a very high reactionary delay propagation. Maybe we can enhance the heuristic that decide if it's worth <coughs> it or not to do that wait for passengers, like looking at the network and the knock-on effect that it will have during, during the day in a different way. Similarly, for the ADCO hours, we have just increased the number of hours that are required. That could be more also done in a more micro level, taking more into account the airspace configuration of the time and so on. And an interesting thing will be running more than one mechanism at the same time. What would happen if we don't only have the passenger reaccommodation enhanced with waiting for passengers, but for example, we put also the DCI. Then you have planes that are waiting, but then they can do something. They can try to recover delay. We are not modeling that because we are running each one of the mechanisms independently. So some synergies may appear if we run more of them at the same time, or maybe the other way around. And one conflict with the other and we are getting a worse result. So running more than one mechanism at the same time with different uptakes, that will be a very interesting thing to do. For the analysis, one thing I didn't mention but that you all noticed probably is that the values of cost resilience are very low and that's because they are distributed for the whole network of operation. But we could apply that metric to a more localized way. For example, computing only or taking only into account the stakeholders that are implementing the mechanism. Therefore, we can see better what is the impact for the ones that are doing it instead of for the whole network as we are doing it now. We can do that division in terms of stakeholders or geographically, considering only the flights of a given area and so on. We can analyze the disaggregated metrics I showed you before. We have many more, as I mentioned before. They are ready. They just need uh, more time to do all that sort of analysis. The payback periods is just a preliminary example we have shown, and that could be extended to try to include normal days of operations and not just 
disrupted days. Finally, the model includes feedbacks, includes this sort of knock-on effects. So explicit analysis could be done and try to see if there is an emergence behavior that we are seeing appearing there that we didn't expect it originally. So that's all in terms of future research. And finally, as Andrew said, we are already thinking in terms of exploitation and further steps that it could be taken. So here, very quickly, you have uh, different exploitation areas and which will be the principal coordination focus we will have to do for them. One thing we could do is analyze the regulation 261 with different uh, changes that could be applied for that and see how the different mechanisms behave in terms of core resilience against that. We can model different airlines policies or strategies that the airlines may do in terms of uh, that. And of course, if we can model different strategies for the airlines, as we have shown, it's very easy to model different mechanisms or model different mechanisms uptakes and see what is the network resilience in terms of this new metric of code resilience. We can align that with the CESAR planning and the performance scheme. Finally, we have the evaluation of the passenger reaccommodation tools as this could be integrated with also decisions at the airport to try to avoid this double effort of delay because you are waiting, then we put a regulation on you and those sort of things. So we can try to think how we can enhance that mechanism to see if it performs uh, differently. Just a brief note, uh, we have this project Vista that uh, from June this uh, year and some of these things could be explored further on that uh, further research. So thank you very much and well, I'm sure that we are all happy to take any question that you may have. Thank you. What is passenger reaccommodation? In passenger reaccommodation, what we have is passengers that are doing connections and that miss the connection at the airport. And then you have to reaccommodate them in a different flight. In the base layer scenario, what we are just looking is like, where do we put that passenger? What is the best cost efficient way of doing that? In the mechanism, we are enhancing that by also including the fact that the airline can decide to wait for that passenger. And so it's how you reaccommodate them on the other flights. Exactly. Was the word accommodation confused me? I thought you were keeping them in hotels or something. Okay. Well, that's part of the model because, of course, if, if they miss the connection for the whole day, you will have to take into account the cost of putting them in the hotel. But that's not what we are explicitly modeling here. Basically, all the service providers such as Amadeus and Sabre who provide these tools, they're all called passenger reaccommodate, reaccommodating them onto other flights. And we worked with Sabre on this. They have rules. They can track a passenger. If you've been disrupted already on six flights, and you're a high yield passenger, they'll rebook you on a competitor. If you're a first time user, they've never seen you before and they've got 10 euros out of you, then you can wait till Kingdom, Kingdom come until they rebook you on one of their own flights later on. So these, they're really sophisticated customer relationship management tools that you can have now have implemented in these passenger reaccommodation tools. Again, uh, an awful lot of stuff. I think we seem to have done a, produced a lot of um, you know, numbers and everything uh, in the last couple of years. But if I understand for the follow-up and the application, what you didn't have was to try and develop investment strategies for the ANSBs or the airlines or something. You seem to be planning to use it to retrospectively analyze things that have already been done. If you aggregate all the sort of kinds of disturbances over a period of a year or five years or ten years, couldn't you then say you should invest here or here or here? Did you want to do that? I mean, kind of a, like a cost-benefit yeah. analysis, yeah, yeah. kind of a CBA thing. I think that's clearly like the intention of how you could be able to apply this. If I understood it right, you said we are doing it like retrospectively, but it's not clear. You seem to be uh, maturities, future mechanism, impacts of new airline policies and so on, that kind of thing. I mean, could you aggregate a year's worth of disturbances and look at the mechanisms and say, right, we need to invest here? Yeah, we yeah. Yeah, we got the results in. I mean, we've, we've had these results for like about a week, so it's all like a little bit fresh. And we just started, I mean, even on the train on the web, we started doing some back of envelope stuff, like you just said, to see, well, if we start reverse engineering this, then how much bang for your buck do you get and where, do you, where should you be investing? And we were looking, for example, if we want to make the passenger reaccommodation cost resilience the same as the, the ATCO hours one, then how much do we have to spend on that or how much would the service providers such as Sabre have to reduce the charging to the airline to make that cost effective for them. So that's the sort of thing we're, we're just starting to do on back of envelopes now to understand how we can compare those and, uh, as you say, to look from the other perspective of, those, uh, of, the, of the cost models. So absolutely is something we want to uh, yeah. follow up on from that perspective.
I have a question on the resilience because we are also using the resilience in the performance. Why? I mean, there is a drop, okay, in terms of capacity or consequence, and then go back to normal for us to measure the impact, so how long it take and what was lost. Uh, but for you, you said it can be up to normal, but can be also to stable situation. Why you consider stable situation? Because for us, events can be stable, but below what was before, we consider it's still a loss due to the impact or to the, uh, the event uh, mm -hmm. that are impacted that yeah. loss of capacity or whatever. So wh why you consider stability and not back to nominal? I would say that because sometimes you don't get back to normal. One interesting thing is that we are computing this cost resilience over the day of operation. So you have to run the whole day normal, the whole day with the disturbance and the whole day with the disturbance and the mechanism to be able to do the comparison. That's why the metrics, as I said, are relatively low because we are aggregating through the whole day. When you have a disturbance such as an industrial action, you are not going to go back to normal operations unless you wait to the next day. And what we are trying to look at is not like what the normal operation is going to be, but it's like if you put these mechanisms in place, your performance in terms of cost are going to be better generally, because that's why you are putting these mechanisms, but you're not going to be as good in terms economically as you were if there were not an industrial action. So we want to see how much are you going back to normal, that maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 10%. That's what we can get from the metric and compare the different mechanisms across them. So we're measuring cost resilience, so how much of the cost you get back, and from the airline perspective. So on a, a typical one of these run days, the total cost of airline delay in the network is around six or seven million euros and whatever you did you're never going to get that back you you've going to have delays we've got a cancellation rate between one and five percent as well so you you can never i mean pretty much never recover that so we're just looking at the we're making a comparison of how much of the cost you can recover but you never get it all back and then if i understand it well as uh, colin was saying then you have different options on the table and with this metric we can compare between them which is the one that will be giving you the best resilience back which maybe is not the 100%, but yeah. Something about the implementation. You had a few thousand runs to do, if I understood. How long did one run take? And why did you bother parallelizing an individual run if you have to do a few thousand? That is the maximum parallelism you can use anyway, I guess. And how long was one run? How long will it take if I put it in my computer? I can answer that. Yes. But So if you put it in a normal computer, normal run, it would take... It's hard because it depends on the scenario. The baseline, maybe uh, less than 20 minutes, okay? But some of the passenger accommodation, which are pretty complex because you do have to compute for each flight uh, several times, then it will take like mm, triple, four times that. And then you have to run it for several times. And then on the parallel, I can tell you because I can tell you how long does it take to compute the average event but not the whole simulation because they are spread on the, on the network. Why did you parallelize an individual run? Why did you not put one run on one machine and you have 2,000 machines for 2,000 runs? Mm -hmm. Why did you make your life complicated? If you put one run on one machine and then another one on another machine, then maybe the first one will be waiting until the other one is finished. So somehow... Yeah, but the runs are independent, no? Uh, yes, they're independent. That's why you can parallelize. But the passenger takes like triple, so you will need like three machines for the passengers, but you don't know that from the beginning. So I think it was just better to do this. Also, MATLAB allows you to do this very easily to parallelize. I mean, it's a step forward, but if you have to do it, it's really hard. But using MATLAB is not so hard. You just have to be sure that your variables are all right, they're dependent, so you can use parallelize uh, iterative. So and at the end, it will take the same time if you don't parallelize that you put it on, on the line. But we didn't know exactly how many machines do we need, so we put it as, as many as we wanted to be sure that we can produce the results in one day or something like that, so the whole thing. Question to complement Colin's point on this, uh, what you call mechanisms, or what we would call maybe solutions or improvements. It's, you mentioned, if I got it right, it was, you had like 25 at the beginning. So the question was like, how did you come to that list? Where does it come from? And how, how did you actually filter it down to four? And you did the simulation, if I understand correctly, only with the final four. Yes. But I guess there will be possibility to go back, if you have the data for the others, yeah, to kind of rerun it to see if you get better results for some of the metrics with some of the other solutions or mechanisms, yeah, yeah. as you call it. That's perfectly right, yeah. So how was it done? Was it like brainstormed yeah. in your team, the 25 yeah, yeah, down yeah. to four? 
It was a very long time. Yeah, it was a long time ago <laughs> to start with. We present some of it in one of the SEEDS conferences, and I have here in the backup slide some information about that, so I can show it to you. So we have uh, different types. Uh, we did a cross-selection. We needed to have the cost because, of course, it's very important for us to have both the strategic and also the tactical cost, and that's not always possible to find. We wanted different locations, like en route and in the airport, and we wanted uh, driven by different things, like looking on the delay or looking at the cost with different stakeholders of takes. So we look in CSR documentation and they, we look in the deployment baseline, the CONOPS, and then with the CSR master plan, that's where we look in the pilot common project, like which are the different solutions, mechanisms that are planned. And here you can see a list of some of them. This is already a short list of mechanisms. For most of them, we will be able to find the cost data, but maybe from some of them, we don't have stakeholders modeling or the stakeholder uptake or there's different parameters. So you can see we have Vapor CDM, but we consider also en route capacity planning tools, enhanced demand capacity balancing tool, improved flight planning, investment in new runways, time bus separations, and so on. Also, this is the list of different mechanisms. These are all the different ones we were considering, like even from en route slot trading or runway occupancy time and so on. The different color coding, to be fair, now I don't really remember exactly how it was because that was like quite a while ago, but it's related with did we have the cost or it was possible to find the cost either in the industry or in documentation, strategic and tactically. So the ones that are in red, we didn't have the cost. This one, we did have the cost with these ones. We almost have the cost, so we were able to get some estimate and so on. And we were considering also, that's what we call the mechanism, because it includes more than a technical solution. It can be also a procedural thing, or it can be a technical solution, or it can be a combination of all of them. It can be what we consider advanced, or it can be basic. These ones is where they are located, the ones we end up selecting. So it's a good cross between these different parameters we consider. Okay, it's good and bad. You selected one that is, let's say, art cost, so it's a SP, yeah. so it's adding more capacity. You selected then the airline processes, basically cost index, dynamic cost index, which is really down to pilot and airline. And the third one, which is really airport and investment in technology solution, which is the CDM. But then at the end of the day, the impact basically on all the different metrics is kind of, it's hard to compare from my point of view, because in terms of the investment strategy, you know, you're not comparing and talking about the same stakeholder. So it's basically three different stakeholders, and so, so their kind of investment decision may be different because, so actually what would make sense, I think, would be maybe in the next round to compare from the same stakeholder point of view three different alternatives. Mm -hmm. And which one of the alternatives gives me the best result for my, let's say, investment. Yeah. So if I take it from my NSP point of view, if I have three solutions, like I have new IMAN, mm -hmm. time based separation or something, I don't know, for yeah, articles, yeah. and then the adding more capacity. One can be technology, one procedural, but from the same stakeholder point of view and the same for the airport and for the airline. That could make them sense in terms of them making decision on what to go forward in terms of uh, investing in uh, some of the solutions or mechanisms, let's say. The main reason for implementing ACDM, for example, is not to mitigate disturbances. It is to make you know, daily operations more smooth. So if, if you're only looking at the uh, at the cost resiliency, of course, then you're missing uh, that, that point. Mm. I completely agree. I mean, we, we could do that. The main problem is to get all the data, as you said. And then the other thing we found interesting by doing different actors that are the ones doing the strategic cost most of the time, like for example with the improving ADCO hours or the ACDM, what well is different than the one that gets the benefit in our model, because as there was saying, like there are other benefits that we haven't considered, like for example in ACDM. Yeah. Even if it's true that the airline will face different options and they have to decide which one, so it will be interesting to do difference within the airline and the NSP is the same. But there is also cross relationships, like when the NSP is deciding to do something, they are not doing it in their own bubble. They are also interacting with the airlines and the airlines may see that they are getting a better result for them if they push one way or another. So we thought it was interesting because this metric allowed to compare that cross comparison in that sense was interesting. But completely agree, of course, we can do many more mechanisms with the same one and so on. It's a matter of getting the data and doing the modeling. And time. And the time, yeah, of course. <laughs> So I mean, we, we had like uh, three years to get to what we think is a what we hope is a, a reasonable proof of concept, and because of limitations of time, as Lewis, we have to run with what we had in terms of the data for the cost and implementation. But our objective really was to come up with a new metric and see if it works, and it gave us some insights we weren't expecting. It seems seems pretty logical. 
Yeah, just to reiterate, I mean, we completely agree. It's a starting point. We're probably a little bit higher than just a, a, a bare proof of concept, but we hope it's a platform that we can build on with appropriate uh, data. And exactly the same in terms of disturbances. We can consider different <coughs> disturbances and see how they perform against that. Yeah. It's ironic that the mechanism that works best under industrial action is increasing at hours, and that's precisely what you won't be able to do. Yes, but that increase in ADCO hours in the ENSP surrounding the one that is doing the industrial action. <laughs> yeah. More questions? Yeah. yeah. A quick one. Just you mentioned uh, 845 tons per flight. Was that the fuel consumption you had for as an average for uh, your flight? Like on, the, on the metrics at the end? Yeah. Yeah, let me see. This is to show yeah, that the resilience that you were asking before, in, in our case, we are competing through the whole, whole network in yeah. the whole day, so it's... it's yeah. But for us, we compare always the reference to the solution, okay, and two different ones, and then we capture the benefit of the concept with the delta, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but on a total cycle. Mm -hmm. So is it for total flight or for a CAC? Uh, some who may be able to... Comment I think some of them went out, some of them were outside ECAC. I would say it's for all the flights in the simulation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, for the so total duration. Yeah. 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 Yes. We have 200 inside Europe and then we have 50 which are yeah, outside, yeah. Yeah. plus an additional airport which is aggregates the mm -hmm. whole, uh, any extra traffic. So mm -hmm. Okay, I was wondering, because the value is two times nearly yeah. what is the uh, average Good. fuel consumption for 10 year flight on the CAC in one year. So no, we also take a long haul. Right. Mm -hmm. But we did consider all of them because also when I was looking at the fitting of the fuel consumption, as I said before, I computed like what is the fuel during the cruise for all the flights that we have and plotted to see how we look. And there were ones with very huge fuel. And then I looked what is that flight and it was like a Singapore to Heathrow with an A380. And it's like, well, it's part of the model. So, yeah, so and, yeah, okay, and then I understand. And there's a lot of rerouting in there and a lot of burning extra fuel to recover delay and a lot of sitting out. So there's a, a lot of things driving the, the average fuel up as well as the fact there's some outside ECAC as well. So yeah, we thought, oh, the number's a bit big, and then yeah. we thought, does it make sense? And I think we convinced ourselves it's, 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 it's fairly reasonable, but okay. if we welcome other opinions of it. So. The recovering of the delay by speeding up, and you say, I think you mentioned that you had some cap on the extra fuel burn, so you tried not to get you like go unrealistic, like you go super fast, yeah. so you had some sort of parameter there. Yeah. But how, how realistic really that was, because obviously airlines do not like it, you know, to speed up too much. So yeah. they speed up only to certain, you know, they have their airline practices on this dynamic yeah. cost or uh, cost indices. But well, I was wondering when you talk about that, airline, of course, especially for the short haul, they look at it as a kind of airframe view for the whole duration. So it's not necessarily trying to reduce, let's say, the delay during the flight with adjusting the speed, but they try as much as possible to shave off from the delay that they can accumulate in the turnaround period. Was that part of the simulation as well, that it would try to actually recover some of the delay during the turnarounds, like looking maybe historically what they did and you would shave off from that? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah. At a ground level, we will have like what are the minimum turnaround times. We have the original schedule to where we have moved the traffic originally and so on. So if that airline at a strategic level has some buffer, that will be there and that will be considered when we are... So with the high priority, would try to reduce the to minimum turnaround and only then it would be speeding up? Yeah, that will be considered. Yeah. And yeah. then in terms of speeding up, when we are doing the mechanism, it's an advanced mechanism, so it's computing for different recovery in times, what will be the cost. And then it's considering the whole cost, which includes the cost of arriving late, of missing connections, but also the extra fuel that is burned. So the fuel will be capped within the mechanisms in the sense that you will not choose an option that is burning way too much because it, it will be more expensive than not doing it. That's why actually we get a better result in terms of fuel. They are burning less fuel. And in the baseline, we were doing only flights that are longer than an hour are going to do that because the cruise otherwise is so short that it's not worth it. They are not going to be able to recover anything. Only 10% of the traffic is doing that. And then we cap the total amount of fuel that we allow to do in this way because for long flights, otherwise you will get unrealistic values. I will have to go back to the actual report because it's in detail there. We can talk about that later. But what we did is to split it as a function of the flight plan length. It's a percentage of the nominal fuel they are carrying or they are going to use. And that percentage changes as a function of how long the flight is, because if the flight is very long, that percentage will be also very big. So we adjust that to get values that are reasonable. We are applying it that only to 10% of the flight. That's the idea. It's not a question, but usually for the, for the flight to speed up, well, it's because of the value of the flight, whether there is a connect, uh, connecting passengers, uh, the reaccommodation, you know, cost. Uh, 
especially with new rules, new European rule. I don't know whether well it is implemented or will be implemented, but uh, the, the cost is huge now for the yeah. accommodation, the obligation from the airline. So this cost is included in the estimate, in the more advanced, me so in the basic mechanism, they just take, they make a stupid decision, which a lot of the airlines, I mean, are doing now. I mean, a naive decision, let's yeah. say. And in the more, as we advance the mechanism, there's more information which is available to the airline in terms of estimating the cost of delay and Regulation 261 impact on the recovery. It'd be interesting to combine DCI and improve passenger reaccommodation, I think. Absolutely, yeah, that's what we were saying on the way here. That could be done, yeah, in two different ways, like coupling them or just running them independently but together yeah, and see. see. Yeah, 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 yeah what they, they will, uh, yeah. the yeah. overall benefit, I would say, of the combination. Yes. Absolutely. The problem is that, it, as, as you well know, it grows exponentially the number of options for the airline if you couple them too much. So you have to have heuristics also and how to model that. It's too complex. On the train, we were saying to Samuel, oh, let, let's try and couple these two. And Samuel was saying, do you realize how long that will take to run? <laughs> yeah. yeah, because... You always start for it, totally. you, you, All the options multiply, so yeah. you will end up with a huge yeah. simulation. But yeah, in theory... Yeah, yeah to see how they combine it. Yeah. How much did you, and I have to figure somewhere, but how much did you spend actually on Amazon Cloud in terms of uh, how much did it cost? In terms of uh, money, mm -hmm. I don't remember because I remember the last figure. So you pay every month, right? I don't remember the... the, la the uh, how, many zero, how many zeros were there? Three. So it's a four figure, like okay. the terms of thousands. For a month, I mean for the final results, the final run. Because there was some previous work that we were using for, I don't know, cleaning data sets or implementing or prototyping. But it really depends on your, the, the computational power you want. So you can spend hundreds to a thousand to, I don't know, I don't want to know. <laughs> but in theory you have unlimited computational power. Good. More questions? Stella, are you still there? Okay. Well, thank you again. <laughs> thank you.